Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to part eight of my statistics tutorial series. In this part of the tutorial, I'm going to show you how ridiculously easy it is to perform regression analysis using a Jupyter Notebook, as well as a ton of really awesome Python data science frameworks. So I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. All right, so in a previous video, I showed you how to set up everything, and why don't I show you the data we'll be working with? All right, so it's gonna be the ice cream data that we brought up before. So we're gonna have temperature and an increasing average temperature and then decreasing as the year goes on and the total number of sales. And what we wanna do is go and create regression lines to estimate these samples. So I went and exported those files as a comma separated value file and it's called ice cream sales.csv. And I'm going to go and create a new notebook and it's going to be a Python 3. And I'm going to start off here by I'm going to hit escape and then M and then enter. And then I'm just going to put a title on this. So I'll call this ice cream sales regression and I'm going to hit control and shift and here is a code window so I could go and type in another heading here but I'm just going to start importing some different modules for us to work with so I'm going to import matplotlib.pyplot as mplot and what this is going to be used for is to create static as well as interactive graphical data plots and I'm going to just go and import a whole bunch of things just so I can talk about each one of these, whether I'm going to use them or not. I'm also going to import NumPy as NP, and it just provides numerous different math functions related to linear algebra and a whole bunch more. And I zoomed in even further just to make sure that you could see everything I'm typing here. And I'm going to cover these different modules later with a lot more detail. So I'm just, this, just consider this a brief overview of much to come. Okay, so I, then I got pandas, which is gonna provide numerous different tools for manipulating tabular data and a whole bunch of other things. I'm also going to import stats models dot API as SM, and it's gonna provide a whole bunch of tools related to statistical data analysis, and I think that's it for now. And now what I want to do is I want to read in my data, that ice cream sales as well as temperature data. So to do that, I'm going to say data. And I can go and put a space inside of here if that makes it a little bit more legible. I can say data is equal to, and I'm going to go PD. I'm going to call pandas to get this information for us. And I'm going to say read CSV. To cover these modules is actually going to take a whole bunch of different videos. So to cover them in the detail that is required. All right, and that's how easy it is to go and get that data. And what I can do now is I can go and get a ton of information about this sample data I just put inside of here just by going data and describe, control and enter. And you can see here, we got a count. We have means for both temperatures as well as, well as sales, standard deviation, minimum values, and then the different quadrant values and so forth, and also a maximum value, all right? So there's some additional information. I'm just gonna hit B and create another code block here inside of here. And now what I'm gonna do is create the regression line. The very first thing I wanna do is I wanna define the, de the dependent variable, which is what we wanna focus on and better understand. I'm gonna give it a value of Y, and it is going to be located under the sales column in the comma separated value list. I'm also going to define this Y label. So M plot and Y label, and it's going to be sales and you can define the font size for it. And I think that 15 works out pretty good. And then after I do that, I need to define the independent variable I wanna focus on, which is whether temperature is affecting sales or not. I'm gonna call this X1 data temperature and again that's from the comma separated value file that we have and I can also define my x label again we're going to say mplot dot x label and it is going to be temperature and again font size equal to 15 and now I can simply create a scatter plot with all this data so I just go mplot and scatter 
and x1 and y and mplot dot show and control return. Oops, got an error. What I do wrong? Oh, I know what I did wrong. Temperature needs to be inside of quotes. So temperature and temperature. There we go. Control return. And you can see it created our scatter plot. So really cool stuff. Now what I want to do is come in here and draw a regression line inside of here. So I'm going to hit B to create another code window. And you know what? I can hit escape and M and I can change this to actually say something. So regression line like that. And now go and create our regression line with our scatter plot. First thing I want to do is I want to define the intercept to the Y line. So I'm going to say X is equal to SM and add constant. And that's going to be X1. Now what I want to do is I'm going to get my results equal to SM. And I'm going to use LLS here which stands for ordinary least squares. Talked about it in the previous tutorial. And it's just going to allow me to estimate the data so a line can be drawn through all of my different data points. So Y and X and fit. I'm also going to say results. I want to get a ton of information on this data, which you're going to see. And I'm going to briefly walk you through what all of it means. Mplot and scatter and this will be x1 and y y hat is going to be equal to 5.9581 i actually know this number because of the summary and the information it provides which you're going to see here in a second times and this is just the slope times x1 plus 35.5616 and then I need to define how I want my regression line to be drawn. List fig, and to do that, you say mplot dot plot x1 once again, y hat, and lw. I'm going to have this be four. I'm going to say that I want this to be an orange line because I think that'll stand out nice. And I'm also going to put a label here which is just going to be regression line. Now I can say mplot and define my X label on this little guy. Temperature, have the font size once again be equal to 15. And I'm also going to do a Y label as well. So let's change this to Y label and change this to sales and font size 15 is fine. And then all I have to do to plot the scatter plot along with my regression line is call mplot.show. Control return. Oops, got an error. Oh, it's just get, saying it's not. I didn't provide enough samples. I only provided 12 and it expects more than 12. But either way, this will work fine. You can see it went and printed that regression line there. And it seems to be in a really good fit. You know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to break this out of here. And I'm going to hit control return. And there's all the data that I was looking for before. And then I'm going to go and create another code window after this and paste in what I had previously and then go and calculate the regression line. All right. So good stuff. And the summary up here, it's just giving me an error because I didn't it wanted more than tw uh, 20 or more samples. I only gave it 12. Don't worry about it. It's not that important right now just for learning the simplistics of this. But what I want to do here is go through briefly what all of these different jargon terms here mean. And you can see here when I calculated Y hat, this is where I got it from. This coefficient down here, 35, say exact same numbers. But I'm going to start from the top and work down and to explain what every single piece of data here means. Okay, dependent variable is sales. Already talked about that. OLS, like I talked about previously, stands for ordinary least squares. And this is just one way to create a linear regression model. And what we do here is we minimize the dependent samples so you can estimate the unknown samples whenever you're creating a linear regression model. And method, least squares, once again, same as what we had before, it just fits the data to the model by minimizing the residual samples. This is the date that we did at the time that we did it. 
r squared up here is just a measure of how well the regression line approximates the data points. And you can see 0.925, that would be very good because values range from zero to one. And the higher the value is, the better it indicates that it will be a good fit. And this is just an adjusted version of this. Then we have the F static, and it measures how significantly the data points fit into the regression model by measuring variation of different sample means. Probability F statistic. Once again, it's the probability that the null hypothesis for the full model is true. And the closer you get to zero, the better the samples approach the model. Then we have log likelihood. And it's just a conditional probability that the observed data fits our model. AIC is going to adjust the log likelihood based on the number of observations and complexity of the model. And it mainly focuses on the data points that best describe our data. The re residuals that we have down here work out to 10. And that just represents the de degrees of freedom. That's what the DF part is. So this is the degrees of freedom of the residuals, which is uh, the difference between predicted values and the measured data. Then it brings us to BIC. We want to have a low BIC, and it focuses on the shortest description of the data, kind of like AIC does. DF model. This is just the number of parameters inside of our model, which we only have one. And then it brings us down here where we have the coefficient constant. So that would be this guy right here. And this is your y-intercept. And if both the dependent as well as the independent coefficients are zero, then the expected output would equal the constant coefficient. So that's why we use that. We have also our independent coefficient, which is going to represent the change of the independent variable per unit. We have our standard error, which is just going to be the accuracy of our coefficients. We have p-value inside of here, and a p-value that is less than 0.05 is considered to statistically significant, so there's something to look out for. And then we also have a confidence interval that we have right here which just represents the range in which the coefficients are likely to fall. So it's just tons of the information that just powers through here. Let's move on. Everything else is the true for, is uh, the same for temperature as well. And this is Omnibus, which is actually called D. Angostino's test. And basically it establishes whether the samples come from a normally distributed population. Then you have Durbin Watson and it's a test basically to see if the errors are not independent. And you're mainly go going to use this to find repeating patterns that may be obstructed by noise. And its value lies somewhere between zero and four. And if you have a situation in which it's greater than two, this is a sign, which we don't have, but this is a sign that the relationships between two variables are going in opposite directions, which means they would be negatively correlated. However, if you have a situation where it's less than two, variables are positively correlated, which is what all the other data is telling us, that the temperature and the sales are correlated. Again, this was the probability of the omnibus. Then you have Jacques Barra. And this is going to test whether the samples match a normal distribution. And it never has a negative number. That's something to be aware of. And the further it gets from zero, the more it signals that the data doesn't have a normal distribution. And as you saw there, we don't. We also have skew, which is going to measure the asymmetry of the probability distribution. And a negative skew is going to indicate the tail is longer on the left side and the concentration of the data is on the right, while a positive is going to indicate the tail is longer on the right. And zero would indicate that the tails are perfectly balanced. And what else do we have here? Uh, kurtosis, this is going to describe the shape of a probability distribution with a focus on the tails and not the peak. So if the value is higher than, that is a sign that there are more outliers. And if the value is less than three, that means there are fewer outliers. And a value of three 
is going to tell you that you have a normal distribution and values greater than three are going to indicate more outliers. I think I covered everything. And then finally, you get down here where we have our condition number, and this is just going to represent whether samples are highly related to in, in our regression model. And a large number is going to indicate strong multicolonarity, um, that these are correlated well, which means that independent variables are highly correlated. And this is sometimes causes problems because a small number of samples are so dramatically different from others. And, uh, but other than that, that's, that's basically everything. So there you go. Uh, that's a brief rundown. This is kind of like an introduction to what is coming up as we are going to start relying less on hard coding, you know, from scratch all of our code and instead relying more and more on these ridiculously awesome data science modules and as well when we get into machine learning. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this tutorial and like always, please leave your questions and comments down below. Otherwise, till next time.